So I want to talk about dead games, and by dead I don't mean, oh well, Fall Guys had like 50 trillion people playing it and now it's only like 2 trillion. No, when I say dead, I mean it got hit by one of the unforgivable curses, straight murder. And yeah, games come and go all the time, but I don't think we really look at what happens after the developers take your favorite software out back like it's old yeller. Side note, side note, old yeller came out in 1957. Why am I referencing Old Yeller? This kid is 80 now. Most of the time, that's just it, right? If the game's not worth keeping alive, then the game was probably terrible to begin with, right? Well, I don't know if that's necessarily all that true. My name is Cube, and in this video, we're going to look at some games that have met with Lady Death and promptly ghosted her. After the explosive growth of Hearthstone, Counterplay Games was determined to take the virtual card game formula and give it their own twist, bringing character through its chess-like movement. This gave creatures not only the typical on-summon or on-death effects that you've come to expect from the genre, but also new, unique options when it comes to positioning. Creatures with the airdrop mechanic are capable of being spawned at any point on the grid, while creatures with the backstab mechanic get an attack bonus when approaching enemies from behind. You can even body block your opponent's units, forcing them to attack fodder creatures instead of your commander, of which exists on the game board just like everything else. The game was generally well liked upon release, with ample reviews acting as reinforcement of the fact. Through a collection of blunders both by developer and publisher, the player base ended up dwindling over time, leading to the closing down of game servers in February of 2020. Nerdslayer has a fantastic video detailing the full decline of the title if you'd like a more in-depth breakdown. So after the game shut down, fans didn't just decide to move on and play another game. Instead, they took it upon themselves to recreate Duelist with the blessings of the developer. In fact, they even have plans to monetize it later down the road. And I actually really like this outcome. Fans get to play the game that they love again, and the new developers get to experiment with new mechanics while forgoing the previously controversial ones. The only thing is, as much as I like this solution, it's not one that you're going to see all that often. You see, games can get incredibly complex, and the vast majority of visual assets for Duelist were already online. I'm actually not sure that if you locked a group of hardcore fans in a room and told them to recreate Rainbow Six Siege, that you'd come back to a finished game. I think more likely they just cannibalize each other. Getting the green light from the developer or publisher is also an area where they lucked out. Not every company is so lax with their IP that they'll ever let fans use their characters and assets. In fact, if you use a Nintendo character for anything, you can set up a speedrunning category for how long it takes to get a cease and desist. I'll leave a link to the Project Megazord Discord in the description if you want to follow development. Wizard Wars was released in 2014 and it might be the epitome of easy to learn, literally impossible to master. So the gameplay consists of combining elemental agents to create spells in a frantic team-based battle arena. This means mixing and matching your 8 available spells, so if you mix rock and fire, you'll shoot a flaming boulder that inflicts burning on someone. But then another person can mix life and water to shoot a beam that both heals that person but also puts out the fire. It's all simple until you realize that you're not just mixing two spells, but a max of three. And now you can mix shield with fire and death, and now you have a protection from those elements. But then they can retaliate with lightning infused with double ice, freezing you. But you can cast shield fire rock to create a barrier in front of you, because you don't just shoot up spells. You can place them in front of you, around you, drop mines, and that's not even getting into skills or how cool it is to say, Magic is an abomination. And just stab them. In July of 2016, Magic of Wizard Wars servers were shut down. Enter Wizard Wars Reborn, where fans found a way to hack back in multiplayer. Here's a post from 2017. DLamming is using assembly to decompile the code of the game to Lua, modify the Lua code, and then using Cheat Engine to inject the code back into the game to test it. With this Lua code, we can learn more about the inner works of the game and understand what we need to do to make it all work. Alright, so with this method, you can't really expect anything crazy like a monetization plan. The game works, and in theory, it's possible to alter the game for balance patches. Even better, the paranoia of, what if the fans get bored, isn't really a problem anymore since the work is already done. I'm not entirely sure how this fares legally, however, though I've noticed that Project Slippy works in a somewhat similar way. Nintendo haven't been able to send the ninjas to finish the job yet, so I'm going to assume that everyone here is safe for the time being. However, it's pretty lucky that someone that played Magicka knows how to do any of this. This is like when your plane is going down and someone screams asking if there's a doctor on board. Maybe there is. Maybe you're just unlucky. Now, don't get me wrong, if my options are between this and literally nothing, please give me Magicka the way it is. Man. 
Wouldn't it be so much better if the developers actually, I don't know, cared? I don't like the fate of a game hinging on whether or not someone in the community happens to be Mr. Robot and also happens to be willing to put in a ton of hours for something that will give us zero compensation. Icon's Combat Arena is a platform fighter, similar to Smash Bros. Okay, it's incredibly similar to Smash Bros. So much so, I think that the community that built up hype for this game played it and had to wonder why bother with Icons at all when they could just play Smash Bros. Add on an almost predatory monetization system and the fact that it's early access and yeah, this game wasn't going to retain a player base for too long, which is a real shame, since a couple of the people that worked on Icons were actually developers that worked on Project M as well, one of the best competitive mods I've ever seen in a game. So you've got a game with very little to offer that's also met with middling responses. You'd expect it to fade into obscurity, right? Well, sort of. So how about one of the devs decided to reject that whole notion, took the assets, and fulfilled his vision of what the game could actually be, and made Rushdown Revolt. I got, I got jab. No jab, that's fast. I <laughs> want the tree royale. Now, even though the graphics and characters are visually similar, the gameplay is not even close to being in the same league as Icons. Rushdown doubles down on the fast-paced gameplay and is actually fun to play, as well as interact with its tight-knit community. Rushdown blew its revival Kickstarter out of the water and is actively being developed. If you're looking at this and you're curious about playing it for yourself, check out the game's Twitter and look out for open alphas where you can play for free and judge the game for yourself. Alright, that was all cool and all, but who gives a shit? Personally, I think there's a large value loss when we let art die, and as someone that could find enjoyment in playing even the most bottom of the barrel shovelware titles, I'd hate to see more games go away. Now are all dead games worthy of preservation? You'd be hard pressed to find someone who's willing to defend The Calling 2, but I'd say that game does double as a cultural footnote. For those that don't know, Calling 2 was released in July 10th, 2018 and shut down servers 8 days later due to being an unfinished nightmare that nobody actually wanted to play. So it's not that I'm asking game developers to keep their cash grabs up to scam people indefinitely, I'm mostly of the principle that if someone paid money for a product, they should be aware that there might be avenues to still access that purchase even if the developers are no longer capable of providing online functionality. However, I'd still like to urge them to look into end of life options to give players some sort of fighting chance to be able to play it, you know, like if there's a doctor on the plane. Ross from Accursed Farms actually goes into this in depth in his video, Games as a Service is Fraud, where he goes over some options game devs have for end of life plans. He describes a bare minimum option that could take as little as a couple of hours to actually get running. Each one of these games offered a unique look into ways a project could be resurrected. Duelist is being remade, Magicka is modded to still work, and Icons is being revamped into an entirely different game. And you know what? It doesn't even end there. The game Paragon went offline and Epic Games decided to not only offer everyone who spent money a full refund, but also put $17 million worth of game assets on the market for free, the only real restriction being you have to use Unreal Engine. Even further, Friday the 13th reverted their matchmaking from dedicated servers to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. It's worth noting that this is much easier for them since they originally launched with peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, If that's not enough, there's an entire Wikipedia page for games whose source code is open to the public. The main point I'm getting at is, go back to some of the games you thought were long gone and give them another look. You might be surprised to see that they're still going strong. Hey, thanks for watching. This took way too long to get out the door, but I hope you liked it. I think moving forward, I'm going to try to balance out these more well-edited videos with something that's a bit quicker to put out. So by the time I do upload, half of you guys aren't forgetting who I even am. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell for notifications, and join my Discord. It's the best way to find me, I post updates all the time, and I'll let you know when I'm streaming on Twitch.